I just want to bring up a few announcements real quick as we get started into our worship service this Sunday, April 26th, 2020. Hoping to be back in church within a month from now. Uh, again, Governor Parsons is going to maybe do a soft open on May 4th. Not sure what that looks like for the tip yet. So I don't want to go ahead and just say, you know, we're going to come in. We're going to do everything normal that we would do normally on May 10th. Uh, just going to kind of keep you guys updated. All right. As we go along this week and next. Uh, again, our announcements, you know, right now media. If you haven't gotten on that, don't forget text right now. Space Mountain View CC to 41411. So 41411 uh, to right now to uh, text right now Mountain View CC to that number and then they will send you a link on how to get that started. If you do it on your computer, then you don't even need to do that because you should already have your password and your information already in there. So that's right now media. Again, do not forget that throughout the week. If you want to pick up communion packets or tithing envelopes, uh, there's also a couple of other things out there for you to pick up if you, if you stop by the church. Um, and we, we can put all those things, uh, we can put the tithing envelopes inside the church office, they'll get picked up. Uh, but yeah, but come in, grab your communion kits. Uh, those are available if you aren't doing, you know, like uh, crackers and soda pop or whatever you're doing or you got at home on hand. So uh, don't forget uh, tithes and offerings. If you want to send those to the church, Mountain View Christian Church, Post Office Box 93, or you can drop those off anytime throughout the week. I keep forgetting that that slide's there. Or you can also use the Tithely app if you haven't done so yet. If you haven't gotten that, again, there's directions on how to use that on the website and also on our YouTube channel. If you haven't gone to the YouTube channel to subscribe, please go over there, find us, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. All right, and that, I believe, is all we have for announcements this morning. Um, so here's how this morning's gonna work. Cindy's gonna be bringing us uh, worship this morning. Then we're gonna come up and we're gonna dive into God's Word. We'll be in Luke 24 this morning, talking about the guys on the road to Emmaus. And then after that, uh, Mr. Fiedler is going to come up and he is going to give us a communion meditation from God's Word. So let's pray and let's get started. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for such a beautiful day outside. God, we thank you that even though we can't meet together, we're still meeting together as the church. God, I love how that you work all things out to good. Father, especially for those who are called according to your purpose. And God, we pray today that as families gather in their living rooms, Father, as families gather together wherever they might be, Lord, that you are praised. God, that you are built up. God, that you are lifted high. And God, just like it says in Psalm 117, verse 1, God, that we extol you. God, that we enthusiastically today bring our praises to you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Christ. Like I said this morning, guys, we will be in Luke 24 this morning as we look at another eyewitness account. This will be our last. Next week, we'll move on. But as we, as we look through this, we're going to look at a couple of guys as they're traveling. And I entitled this morning's message, Discovered. Because the reality is, is these guys will discover who Jesus is, and, and that's what we need to do. I mean, no matter where we're at, we're always going to be learning something new about how God works. And so I want to propose a riddle to you. Some of you guys who've gone to high school camp, you may know this, all right? Some of you in youth group, you might know this because you've heard me say this before, all right? But those of you who may not have heard this before, here's my riddle. A woman shoots her husband. Holds him underwater for five minutes, finally hangs him. Five minutes later, they enjoy a wonderful dinner together. How can this be? You see, it's not until you realize, or until somebody tells you the answer, does this riddle make any sense whatsoever. And that's exactly what's going to happen with these two men. They're going to have all this information they're going to have all these things, but at the end of the day, it did not make sense until it was explained to them. And so they're going to do three things, and we're going to look at this this morning. First of all, they're going to encounter Christ. After they encounter Christ, they're going to hear the explained Christ so that they could experience Christ. And I love that because that's exactly what happens with us. We have got to encounter Jesus so that we can explain Jesus or that he can be explained even more to us. That way we can experience him. So if you have your Bibles in Luke 24, let's start in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. After seven, about seven miles from Jerusalem, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, and I'm going to stop right there. Because let's unpack what we just read. See, it's at this moment, again, like we talked about last week, where they're actually diving into it. These guys are on the road, and they're having a discussion. The NIV says these two guys were discussing these things. Now, that word discuss in the Greek can also mean dispute. And so here's what I kind of envision going on here, is these two guys are like, they're having a friendly discussion slash dispute about everything going on. It's like when you and I look at something and we have different points of view on the same thing. It's like, you know, uh, really, I guess one of the best examples we could use is if you're studying the book of Revelation with other Christians, you could have quite the discussion or dispute about who's right and who's wrong. And so I envision these guys, they're disputing, they're discussing. It's like, what's going on? All right, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about that? Yeah, but what about... And it's at that moment through all of this that I just wonder to myself, how long is Jesus following behind these guys before he really catches up to them? You see, the reality for you and I, and, and I'm again, I'm listening to this book that was loaned to me, um, about a, the spiritual realm. And it's really amazing because the author said something that I listened to yesterday. He goes, you know, you and I, we have like hindsight. We have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. We, got, we can already put it all together. Like we know that this is Jesus already. These guys didn't know this was Jesus. These guys have no idea who this person is. And so I just wonder how long is Jesus walking behind these guys or kind of, you know, catching up to these guys listening to them as they discuss all these events. And then the moment happens where Jesus catches up to them. And Jesus says, you know, he, it says in verse 15, then Jesus himself came up, walked along with them, but they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who it was. And then Jesus finally says, it says in verse 17, he asked him, hey guys, what are you discussing together as you are walking along? Now I'm going to stop for just a moment because here's that moment. They don't recognize Jesus. And this within itself is a miracle. All right? Because if we look at the book of Mark chapter 16, Mark 16 says that Jesus appeared to these guys in a different form. 
What did, what did Jesus look like at this point where they couldn't recognize him? I was talking to Lindsay about this this week, and I'm like, you know, it was almost like one of those moments where, like, Jesus kind of blurred out his face. And, like, they could hear him, but it's like, oh, who is that? And they're trying to look through it. But, no, that's not how it was. The reality is, is they didn't recognize him because I, I believe the scripture says he was in a different form. God had hidden who Jesus was from these guys. So, again, just kind of the humor in all of this. Think through this for just a moment and all the humor and all this. What are you discussing together as they walked along? They stood still, so they just paused all of a sudden. As their faces are downcast, one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And then Jesus says, What things? Kind of plain ignorant, except Jesus knows exactly everything that's happened. And more so than what these guys know. And that's amazing to me. It's like, all right, first of all, who are you? Second of all, what rock have you been hiding underneath the last week and a half? What do you not know? What do you not understand? And, and, and so they need, right now as they are encountering Jesus Christ, and here's the amazing thing. And I, and I pause for just a second because, listen, you and I are going to encounter people who are in the image of Jesus Christ. We're not going to recognize it until after the fact. When somebody comes up to you and says something to you, when somebody comes up and becomes a friend to you, when somebody comes up and does something for you or your family that shows Jesus Christ, you don't see it in that moment, but when you come back to realize it, that's when it is. And that's what happens here. And that's what we're unpacking here this morning. You see, I brought you that riddle, and I'm not going... Uh, some of you may have moved on. I'm hoping most of all of us have moved on. But just in case you haven't moved on from that riddle a little bit ago, okay? A woman shoots her husband, holds him underwater for five minutes. Finally, she hangs him five minutes later. They enjoy a wonderful dinner together. Okay, a lot of you younger people are not going to understand this, but the lady was a photographer, okay? She took a picture of her husband. Used to, you had to hold them under a solution to get the picture to come out, okay? And then you hang those pictures up for them to dry, okay? So I'm moving on. That's explained, okay? Now, <laughs> all right, so now we're moving on. But look at what goes on here. Now, about what things? About, and these men go on to talk to him about this. About Jesus of Nazareth, they reply. You know, he was a prophet. He did some amazing and powerful things. Okay? But not only before God, before everybody. Now, not only those things, but the chief priests, our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. And we hoped that he was going to be the one who was going to redeem all of Israel. Listen, this is what these guys are saying. They're, they're telling Jesus, we hoped that you, not knowing this, we hoped that you would deliver us over our Roman bondage. You didn't do that, Jesus. You didn't do that. What's more is it has been the third day since all this took place. And I pause there for just a moment because why does that really matter? Now, first of all, this tells us that this was most likely Sunday that all this happened. These events are happening. Maybe they're walking home on, on Sunday night, which is the first day of the week, not the Sabbath. Okay, they're walking home when all these things take place. And also, another tidbit of information for all of us is that Jews considered, some Jews considered that the body, the spirit hovered around the body for three days. And then it was taken up or it was gone. So perhaps they have this mindset where, you know, it's been three days, his spirit is no longer there. It's not even hovering the body. It's gone. So why downcast? Because things aren't working out how we expected them to work out. In addition to this, some of our women amazed us. They ran to the tomb early and didn't find the body. They came back and told the men that and they had seen visions of an angel. Who said he was alive? And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. And they didn't see Jesus. 
All of these things. As I was reading through Mark Moore's uh, notes on, on, on this passage in Luke, I love what he said. He goes, basically, this is what they're just saying. He says, these guys are like, the women are flipping out. They're thinking they're seeing angels. Two of the apostles, they ran. They saw nothing. No one sees Jesus. No one's even hinted at knowing where he's at. Why shouldn't we be downcast? And then it's at this point, Jesus is going to mildly rebuke these guys. And I say mildly because I think Jesus always does it in love when people don't understand. He's not just going to full out rebuke these guys. And look at what he says in verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are. Now, he's not calling them dumb. He's just kind of calling them ignorant. How ignorant of all of this are you guys? You're not stupid. You're not dumb. You understand some of these things. It's kind of like what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Paul said, I am under obligation to preach to somebody who doesn't understand Jesus Christ. Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 to teach and preach such things because there are some people that are going to be foolish when it comes to their money and they're going to fall into temptations and snares. It's a foolishness. It's not that people aren't smart. It's just that they do dumb things. And then in Titus chapter 3, he also warned Titus that once even you and I, once you and I were apart from Christ and we were foolish ourselves. You see, when we don't recognize the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, then we're foolish. And that's where these guys were. It wasn't that they did not know who Jesus Christ was or what had happened this week. It was just they didn't realize and understand that it had to happen this way. And so Jesus starts with this mild rebuke, and then he goes in to explain the Christ. So here comes the second part of this as we look at verses 25, 26, and 27, and the Christ explained. And man, I stop and I wonder, just where, where did Jesus go? Like, this sermon that he's getting ready to teach, the, or this lesson he's getting ready to teach these guys? Like, what did Jesus teach them? Where did he go? What did he say? Now, if we would have had one of the authors to write that down for us, man, how much easier would it have been to be like, all right, this is how Jesus did it. This is how I'm doing it. All right? But it doesn't. It doesn't do that. So we're kind of left up to, you know, I wonder what Jesus did. You see, what, what's happening here is these guys are seven miles away from home that we're told earlier in the, in the chapter. Seven miles. So Jesus has seven miles to walk and talk with these guys and explain the scriptures to them. And in my running mentality, I'm thinking, all right, seven miles. Let's say you go about 20, uh, 20 minute miles. That's three miles an hour. That's about two, let's just say two hours for Jesus to unpack the scriptures to them. And if they're pausing right here to talk to Jesus, maybe they had other moments where they paused and they talked. And so for two hours, this unrecognizable Jesus just tells them all about himself. Not really that, not about himself, but about the redemptive work, about why it had to happen this way. And so he goes, and you know, so I, I just wonder, you know, did he, did he start with Genesis chapter 3? Did he go into, you know, Genesis chapter 12, Abraham being called, Abraham's seed being, being a blessing? Did he go to Genesis 22 and God told Abraham to sacrifice his son and Abraham in faith, you know, did not do that? Did he go over in death? Did he go over into Isaiah 53 and talk about the suffering servant? Did he go over into the Messianic Psalms like 2, 16, 22, 110? Like where did Jesus go with all of it? And the reality is we just don't know. But perhaps he covered more than we do know. I mean, so this is what it says. Are you guys slow to believe all that was spoken by the prophets? Did not the Messiah have to suffer all these things and then enter into his glory? I mean, you think about the prophets. You think about Isaiah 53. He's going to be crushed, bruised, hung between two robbers, stricken. Zechariah chapter 11, he's going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver to which they're going to buy a field with. 
In Malachi chapter 4, he was going to be preceded by a forerunner. And then you come back to Psalm 110, which says, Then the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Which, coincidentally enough, here in a few weeks, Peter's going to use on the day of Pentecost. And not only Peter using that on the day of Pentecost, but we're going to also see the author of the book of Hebrews use it in chapter 1, verse 13, describing and showing who Jesus is. So the big question was, was Jesus upset with these guys? Because some people think he was. I don't think so. I don't think Jesus was upset with them. I think Jesus just at this moment was explaining the reality of who he was. And here, here's what it is. You guys, you foolish, are you slow to believe? And I ask you that same question. And I ask myself the same question. Because there's two things that have, hap that have to happen to us. And I think there are two questions that we always have to ask ourselves. Is, do I still trust it? And do I still believe it? Do I trust it just as much today as I did when I first believed it? Do I believe it just as much today as I first trusted in it? And these guys, they wanted Jesus to do something for them. And Jesus said, that's not the way it's got to be. That wasn't what I came to do. So he didn't call them stupid. He just called them slow. And man, I have moments where I'm slow. And I still have moments where I'm slow. In fact, there's still moments in Scripture where it's just like, I, I failed at that again. It's okay. Yes, they believed Jesus was a man. But they didn't fully believe yet that he was God. They were kind of slow. They weren't quite there yet. And, and, and I kind of, I, I love that because, listen, there are, and here's the reality of it. There are religions out there that believe Jesus was a man. There are religions out there that believe Jesus was a good man. But to call him God takes a step that they're not willing to take yet. And, and, and J. Warner Wallace does a great job explaining this. If you want to go to coldcasechristianity.com, J. Warner Wallace was a, um, a detective, a forensic, forensic detective. I think he still might be. And like he said, he, he talks about this, and he's even on uh, Right Now Media. And J. Warner Wallace is even on some Right Now Media things. Little two, three minute clippets if you want to get on there and look for J. Warner Wallace. Great stuff. But he takes it from the point of view of a detective. And I love it. And this is what he, and this is just kind of where I took all my information real, real quick. But Jews, this is what he says about Jews. They believed Jesus was Mary's son, was a teacher, had many disciples, was respected, performed miracles, claimed to be Messiah, crucified on a cross. They acknowledged his followers reported that he had raised from the dead, but they will not acknowledge that he was God's son. Like Messiah. Like Christ, like the one who died for the sins of the world. That takes it too far. Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he is to be revered and respected, that he was a prophet, a wise teacher who worked miracles, ascended to heaven, will come again. However, not the only way. Not the only way. So when it comes to accepting Jesus as the only way, they can't take that step. Hindus believe that Jesus was a holy man, a wise teacher, and that he is a little G God, not a big G God. Buddhists believe Jesus was enlightened and was a wise teacher, but to call him God, we cannot. New Agers believe and maintain that Jesus was a, mild, uh, was a wise and moral teacher, yet when it comes to the point of Jesus being God and the only way to salvation, just can't quite do it. These two men, go back and look at what they do. Look at what they say to him. What's more is it has been three days since all this took place. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. When the reality is he did redeem Israel, just not in the way that they expected it to be done. And so Jesus, as he goes through all this, 
he gets to this point. He's like, you guys are missing the redemptive work. That was the point of it. It wasn't to redeem you from an earthly oppression, but a spiritual one. Because this earth is not your home. To take it from the hymn author, we're just passing through. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth, and it's going to be even greater than what we see now. And man, I can't wait to see that. So you can definitely say that these guys expected and believed Jesus was the one who could deliver them. He, they believed he was a prophet. Yes, they believed all of this, yet they did not see the redemptive work in all of it. But they're going to get to experience Christ. And they're going to do it in two ways. And this is really where we have to pick up the torch where these guys are at. If you have your Bibles, again, we're going to start in verse 30 here. No, we're going to start in 28. Now, as they approached the village they were go to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go further. Now, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to skip down because we're going to come back. Now, in verse 30, when he was at the table with them, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. Jesus comes into the house this night with these men. After a long journey, well, seven miles, I'm, some of us would consider that long. After that amount of time together, they sit down and they eat a meal. As one author points out, he says, they come into the house, and look who takes the form of the host here. It's not the guy whose house it belongs to, or the other friend. They sit down to eat a meal, and Jesus all of a sudden takes the form of a host. Because Jesus is the one picking up the bread. Jesus is the one breaking it. He's the one passing out. To which I thought, in my mind, I'm like, isn't that the way it needs to be in our homes? When we sit down at the table to eat together as a family? Or when we're out with any of our friends? Don't we have to remember who's the actual host of this entire thing? The one to which we owe all things to? So their eyes, it says right here, as Jesus handed it, as he broke it, as he gave it to him, it says that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. What did they recognize? I, I, as I read and as I studied this, I just wondered, like, what part of Jesus did they recognize first? Because these are a couple of the things that we know. These two guys on the road to Emmaus, they weren't part of the 12. Although some suspect that one of them may have been Luke, or one of the author writing here, or that it may have been Nathaniel, but that seems illogical because of what's going to happen immediately after being in the house. I don't know who the second guy is. We're going to talk about it in a second. But we know one guy, Cleopas, we know he wasn't a disciple. So they weren't in the upper room when Jesus broke the bread. So obviously this wasn't some form of the Lord's Supper. It was just a general meal. But how did they know? One author says, you know, perhaps when Jesus raised the loaves and broke it, it was similar to what Jesus might have done when he was feeding the 5,000 or the 4,000. Or maybe other times that we don't know about in scriptures. And the way he did it and then the manners that he did it, they understood, oh no, nobody else could do this but Jesus. My favorite is perhaps when Jesus lifted the bread up and broke it. God had you know, put a veil over his face, but not, not over the nail holes. And then they saw the nail holes. And then immediately in that moment, their eyes were opened to recognize that this was Jesus. And in that moment, everything just kind of, the veil was lifted and they're like, we know who this is. We know exactly who this is. And, and I love this because it says that their eyes were open and they recognized him. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't stick around for questions. He's out of there. And, and is this really out of the character of Jesus? Because you think about it for just a second. 
You know, let's go back to, to Matthew. Let's go back to feeding 5,000 people. Jesus feeds 5,000 people. All of a sudden, they want to make him king. Jesus is like, it's not time yet. And the Bible says that he passes right through them. Well, how did he do that? We don't know. We don't know how he does that. We just know that he does it. But right here in Luke, it says that he disappeared from their sight. Now, a 19th century author, Frederick Goddard, writes how Jesus had already been gone. So perhaps really the miracle wasn't that Jesus uh, left in a flash, if you will. Perhaps the miracle was that Jesus was actually with them the whole day. Maybe we're just looking at it from the opposite way. Maybe we should look at it from the point of view that it was a miracle in itself that Jesus had appeared to these two men on the road. That Jesus himself appeared to them on the house. And then all of a sudden, just like before this day, he was gone again. But I want you to see their response. You see, experience here, much like love, we've got to treat it like a verb. We've got to treat it like something that unfolds and something that we do. Because I love what it says here. It says, they asked each other in verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us, while we were on the road, while he opened up the scripture to us? And that's that moment where it's just like the whole time that you're doing Bible study, like you are into it, it is just in here and you're like, oh man, I am eating this up. That's the burning inside that I think that they had. That moment where, you know, you're getting close to home. And you're like, I don't want to be close to home. I want us to start back over again. I want you to keep going. As you're sitting at the table and it's about time to go, it's just like, don't go yet. You've got so much more to say. Were not our hearts burning? Were they not lit up inside of us while he was talking? How many times? is God described as a fire in scripture. When he pulled him out of Egypt and he led him by night. Maybe you, maybe like me, you have a, a depiction of God talking to Moses on top of a mountain. And I'm gonna bring up another old movie again. So in Cecil B. DeMille's adaptation of the Ten Commandments, some of you kids are like, what? There's, there's this, and it's just always stuck in my brain, Charlton Heston is Moses up on the side of the mountain, and here's God writing the Ten Commandments with fire. I don't know if that's how God did it, but it just always seemed cool in my eyes, and that's how I envision God having done it. She's like, God's like, <sighs> like God is his fire. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says, God is a consuming fire. And right now, just that consuming inside of everything. Were not our hearts burning within us as he unfolded the Bible to us? As he unfolded the prophets and Moses to us? And so they got up in verse 33 and they returned at once to Jerusalem. So they've traveled seven miles, had a meal with Jesus, Jesus leaves, and the immediate first thing that they do is turn around and go the other seven miles back. They don't sleep. They don't hesitate. They get out, and they go. And then it says that once they found the 11, and those of them assembling together, they said, It's true. The Lord has risen, has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them, and how he broke the bread. They experienced Jesus Christ. They experienced him. Anything that would take you to action is an experience. And that's what happened. They tell him it's true. The women sing the angel. Peter and John running to the tomb? No, Jesus, yeah, he wasn't in there because he's alive. He wasn't in there because, yeah, he's risen from the dead. And it started back in verse 28. I think these are some of the keys to it. 
As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go further. Verse 29, but they urged him strongly. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. It's evening. Like it's almost 6 p.m. It's almost done. These guys get up. It's dark outside. And they're running to Jerusalem. There's two things about this passage that I, I really want us to recognize and understand. As they walked with Jesus, they may not have fully recognized who he was, but they knew that they wanted him. And they knew that they wanted him in his home. Stay with us. Have a meal with us. Whether it was them just being, you know, uh, culturally friendly, as they were, I don't think that. I think it was more spiritual and, and cultural, but spiritual too. I think that they knew there was something more. And when you and I open this thing and dive into it, that's our question. That's, you know, that, that is the question. Like, do we want more out of it? Or do we want it for the surface? Do we want to know Jesus more than just a man? Or do we just want the, he was a good man. And they invited him in to their home. We never find out who the second man is in this story. And I was telling Lindsay about this this week. You know, I, I really like the, the reality that we don't know who the second guy was. We know who Cleopas was, but we don't know who the second guy is. Because that allows us to walk into the story. You put yourself as the second person in this story. Maybe somebody else is asking the questions, but you're there with. Maybe you have questions, but you're there with. You see, we don't have to have it all figured out for Jesus to walk right beside of us. We don't have to have it all figured out for Jesus to be invited into our homes. We don't have to have it all figured out to say that we believe. And, and I think that's just how God works. I know that's how God works. But here's my question for you this morning. Where does Jesus fit in? Do you recognize him? Or is he a blurred out face? Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. Go therefore into all the world. These men, after having this meal, they got up and they ran seven miles to tell other people about Jesus and what he had done for them. When was the last time you're like, you know what, I'm gonna get up and run seven miles to tell somebody about who Jesus is. Like the work and the effort that it took for these guys to get back to Jerusalem as quick as they could. Because here's the reality, time is short. Time is short. We don't know how much time there is, but I know this, that we live in the last days. And if there was an ever a time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is that day. And here's the great thing. You don't have to have it all figured out. All you have to do is know that Jesus is the only way. That Jesus can redeem you. That Jesus can spiritually bring you in. Now, there are steps to that. Okay? There's a process to it but you've heard it. And the next thing you've got to ask yourself is do I trust it and do I believe it? And then we can move from there. As you're in your, your homes or wherever you might be, ask somebody around you to explain Jesus a little better to you and take those next steps. Maybe you've already taken all those steps. What is stopping you from recognizing Jesus even more? today. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you so much for your redemptive work on the cross. Thank you so much for Jesus, who at times will come into our lives and we don't recognize him, we don't know him, but God, you do. 
You know what's inside of our hearts and you know exactly what we need. God, and I thank you that unlike Abraham, Father, you showed what it meant to actually sacrifice your son on the cross. And Father, I pray for, I pray for our church. I pray for the church. God, that we would see Jesus recognizable in such a large way as we continue through 2020, God, as we continue past this, this uh, pandemic, God, as we move to the next step in our spiritual walks with you. God, to the heart right now who is accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today. Father, to the heart right now who is taking the next step in their faith. God, I pray for guidance. I pray that you would continue to strengthen them. I pray that you would send people into their lives. Father, that would help them walk with Jesus. Father God, that we would as a nation invite Jesus back into our homes to dine with us and to be the host. God, I thank you again for every opportunity that we have to share the love of Jesus Christ with each other. And this we pray all in the name of Jesus. Amen. doing this than in a room full of people, so bear with me. It's really strange, I guess it's not really strange, but it's a God thing when you sit down and write a couple of different meditations, you do one, and you have it, and you're ready to go, and then you wake up the morning of the meditation you're supposed to do, and just something else comes to you, and uh, you start digging around, and then Eric, does what he does this morning and just kind of brings everything together so bear with me here so in my attempt to adapt to country life I have tried to plant several gardens each year I was able to cultivate dig and reap the benefits of my attempt two torn up tillers lots of weeds and rocks more rocks I think you plant them like potatoes you put one in the ground and many come up I'm telling you though, this year will be different. My family will reap the benefits of a garden this year, minus the rocks. In Matthew 13, 24 through 30, there's a parable he puts forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while we, you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat within them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. 
So here we have a parable about sowing seed. The focus is on the kind of seed that is sown and the plants that grow from it. Good wheat seed is planted in the field and weeds are also sown. Given the choice to remove the weeds, the owner declines wanting the wheat to grow. He decides to let the weeds remain. The weeds remain. If the weeds were uprooted now, the wheat also would be uprooted. The owner knows that at harvest time it will be easier to separate the wheat from the weeds. In the meantime, the wheat will grow as wheat and the weeds will remain weeds. Let them grow to maturity and then the two can be separated easily. The weeds, full, the, the weeds fruit is obvious in contrast with that of the weeds. This is a picture of how God's word and life grow in us while we live each day in the field of this world. It is easy to fit in, to be like other people around us. And when we are surrounded by the sin and evil of this world, we can be overcome and un with uncertainty. But our Lord knows, and he chooses not to remove us from the field. He allows us to stand in contrast to the weeds as we produce the crop that we are intended to. This parable comes as a message of encouragement. We need to trust the field owner and his love will see us through to maturity. I pray this morning that we are, as we go get ready to get rid of social distancing and that sort of thing in the not too distant future, I hope we go out and mix among those who do not know him, but they see them, see him through us. And that's my prayer this morning as we take our communion emblems this morning, I just pray that we stay focused on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. If you would pray with me at this time. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity that we can come to you this morning and, and remember your sacrifice. And we just praise and thank you for your many blessings. We ask God that you will just guide and direct our lives. And when things are, 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 are set up to where we can go out and be among people and, and even those that are allowed to do that now. Those of us that can't, I pray God that when we get there, Lord, I just pray that we show others you and that your love and your light shine through us and we just are able to show people what you are all about. I pray for blessings upon them this morning as, as folks take them, whether here or at their homes. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.